feel affects their work to some or to a great extent. As a good employer, one of your roles is to provide a working environment which is flexible enough to allow these employees to keep working, maybe even to recover or make lifestyle changes which will reduce the impact of their ill health long term. So well, workplace wellbeing awards schemes recognise the opportunity presented by workplaces as a venue for health interventions. And if you'd like to look further into the evidence base that I've just given you a very brief overview of, here are some uh, fantastic reports that I very much recommend. So what has been the impact of COVID-19 <clears throat> on workplaces? COVID-19 has had an enormous impact on the working age population. We've seen mass working from home, many families schooling from home alongside, the furlough scheme affected almost 9 million employees at its height. We're seeing unemployment, unemployment levels rising sharply as roles disappear and businesses go bust or cease trading. Our expectation, according to the Federation of Small Businesses, is that a quarter of a million SMEs will have closed by the end of the pandemic. And specific sectors have been hit hardest in different ways. As an employer, you are likely to be recruiting from a pool of people who've been through the COVID mill. So what does the future hold? Top of the list is the actual direct recovery of COVID-19. COVID-19 is, as I'm sure you're aware, a tenacious infection. NICE have identified over 50 symptoms with one in 10 cases suffering fatigue. NICE guidelines on recovery from the COVID-19 virus indicate some difficult timelines. Acute COVID requires an average of four weeks to recover from. Ongoing COVID can last up to 12 weeks and post COVID or long COVID issues can take months to recover from. An international study identified from 4,000 long COVID cases that after seven months, 22% were still on sick leave and 45% were still on a phased return to work. For businesses where the usual sick leave policies cover a six month period before redundancy, we may have to learn to be more flexible. We're still understanding what long COVID will mean for the Southwest, but the NHS's website, which I've referenced there, Your COVID Recovery, contains a lot of information to support both employees and employers to understand the issues. We are all aware, I hope, of the impact the past 15 months have had on employees' mental well-being. We know from surveillance data that mental distress increased during the pandemic, and all demographic groups experienced this increase in mental distress but it was followed by a decrease for most groups. But the change was larger for young adults, so the 18 to 30 year olds, women and those identifying as non-white and those with an income over 50,000 pounds. Sleep disturbances increased from 16% before the pandemic to 25% in April, 2020, which is three months into the pandemic. Another impact of the pandemic we're expecting is an increase in musculoskeletal disorders characterized by bodily pain, which restricts movement. The hasty development of home offices, people working from the kitchen table or sofa, it's expected to result in an increase in MSDs. And unfortunately, exacerbating this is the knock-on effects of the cancellation of surgeries during the pandemic. We now have a backlog of delayed um, surgeries, which it may take some time to clear. And in the meantime, people continue to suffer more pain for longer than they should, restricting their opportunities to maintain good fitness levels and impacting on their working life. For this reason, the NHS is prioritising standing back up the MSK services. And the changing workplace as well. The future holds a different attitude to working locations. As offices are reopened, many employees and employers have embraced the working from home philosophy. Access to broadband and Wi-Fi has become a prerequisite for many jobs. But what about those who don't have broadband or those who don't have digital skills? Collectively, we have a role around digital inclusion, and I know Plymouth are leaders in this field with the work that was done during the pandemic on community Wi-Fi by Nudge Community Builders, University of Plymouth and PCC. As employment, unemployment rises, there will be a need for retraining and reskilling amongst the newly unemployed. On Monday, the restart funding was announced with a programme through CTEC Plus that will be available in this area. So what's your role as an employer? Step one, pay the living wage. Pay at a level where a reasonable standard of living is possible, 
Within the Southwest, we would like to see every organization commit to paying the living wage to all of their staff. Recovering from trauma. Many people have suffered trauma due to the pandemic, losing a loved one, being unable to attend the funeral, losing a job, being unable to find a new one, food shortages, fear of the virus, experience of the virus, certain professions being on the front line, especially our blue light professions, healthcare, hospitality, retailers, and key workers. Supporting people to recover from this trauma is going to fall largely upon employers. Organizational recovery. Recovering as an organization from the impact of the pandemic will take a while. To support this, Public Health England Southwest recently published their recovery framework, which outlines evidence base and recommendations for priorities around a number of topics, including MSK, workplace health and mental health. Social value and anchor institutions. Recognition that county, regional or national employers have a role in, as an anchor institution and as a venue for health interventions. For example, an NHS hospital may be the largest employer in a city. If their employees have good working conditions and health, that impacts on the health of that area. Additionally, when you're procuring resources or deciding who to hire, where to build new offices, for example, the anchor institution should recognise the impact they can potentially have on the local economy. The NHS's Health Anchor Learning Network, which was recently launched, attempts to use the resources of the large public sector employees, employers sorry, in a geographical location to contribute towards a cyclical economy. This draws attention to what all employing organisations can do to maximise their social value. Hire locally, use local labour for capital projects, buy locally, invest in and build local supply chains. And finally, the fundamental importance of compassionate line managers cannot be underestimated. Within your organisations, you will have wellbeing champions and mental health first aiders who provide peer-to-peer -peer support to your employees. The next step is to ensure your line managers are also supportive of wellbeing, so that when a peer mentor reports an issue or supports an employee to report an issue, they are met with compassion and empathy. I believe the next speaker from St Luke's will go into more detail on this. So I hope you found that interesting. And the last few slides are um, the resources that are available online, some that Public Health England have, have um, published with the business in the community. And hopefully you're aware of these already, but just in case you aren't, this is a summary toolkit that was published earlier this year um, in response to a request to summarize all of these toolkits, which are also available from the website. In addition, we've got the which I'm sure you're all aware of, the One You Employer Toolkit, which provides resources for you to encourage your employees to make small life like lifestyle changes that can make big differences. And finally, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. But uh, these are references and also these are some hyperlinks. So when the slide sets sent around, you should be able to click on these and if you want to know any more, um, go to the appropriate website. So thank you very much. I hope I caught up some time, Greg. Thank you so much, Claire. Yeah, and uh, um, well done on accepting the challenge from us to kind of get that much information um, into what was a really short period of time. And um, having checked the chat bar, yeah, there's a few people just asking about um, presentations and they'll all be shared with, with everyone after the event. Um, we've all got your email addresses um, and yeah, all the presenters, the slides will be both emailed across to you hopefully um, and also added to our website as well. So you can go and check there. Um, we'll add the link to that particular part of our website within that kind of um, follow-up email that everyone will receive. So one way or the other, yeah, you'll be able to check out all that, all that information. And as Claire said, you know, there's so much information out there at the moment, you know, that businesses can use to support um, their, their workforce. Um, and something that kind of really hit home towards the end of your presentation there, Claire, was about the, the role that line managers can play. And, you know, we've certainly been having those conversations within Live Well Southwest about the impact. There's just those daily conversations can have, you know, uh, between between staff and managers. So, you know, I think we're, we're looking to sort of um, put better training and support in for for those individuals as well but no thank you so much Claire um and yes you did catch up a little bit of time so well done on that as well uh, um but as usual I'm gonna have to shut myself up um and we're gonna pass over to the next speaker um who's uh Lee Jones from St Luke's Hospice so um Lee if you're there if you're 
happy to start um, sharing your screen. I am. And um, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lee. Um, and I'll, um, I'll pass across to you. No problem. Thank you. Um, bear with me. Oh, there we go. Hopefully that's all everyone can see now. Um, so yeah, my name's Lee Jones. I'm Head of Organisational Development from St Luke's. Um, and following on from Claire's um, conversation there, actually, um, focusing on people's well-being um, and how important that is, not only from an engagement perspective, but from an organisational perspective. Um, the focus of, of my presentation to you this morning is um, the recognition of end of life within that. Um, so as you can see here, um, there's reference to, to the fact that, you know, this is something that we all go through, we all experience. People who are dying, have terminal illness or are carers um, express feelings of being isolated um, and lonely as their world shrink um, and people gradually avoid either them or talking to them about these issues. Um, what we'll do, uh, what I'm intending to do is to give you an overview of what St Luke's does hopefully every day with compassion, integrity, respect and professionalism um, is to look after those with these illnesses whilst also supporting those around them and their well-being and how that's key in workplaces for all of that data that you've just seen now. Um, we'll have a focus on how we can change this isolation and impact on well-being, really to come up with some solutions focus, focused approaches. End of life needs to be recognised by us all as friends, families, colleagues and employers. It's just such a, an important um, aspect. Um, so again, it's the, the great taboo. Um, a lot of people are uncomfortable talking about death or avoid the topic altogether. Other words are used, for example, you know, we often say past or taken from us. But actually, um, I think it's important to recognise that we do need to give people the space to talk about that. And particularly having gone through COVID and understanding the impact that death is going to have had in those circumstances there will not be typical circumstances at all um, so the recognition is just so key um, and it's also important as part of today's discussion to recognize that some of us respond in different ways some are able to continue um, through work and through life others it has a massive impact on their actual well-being so going to the next slide um, I'm just wondering, um, I don't know if everybody can use the icon with them um, reactions, just about the Compassionate City and how many have actually heard of, of the Compassionate City um, programme. So hopefully there's quite a few and I should imagine that those that have actually got the Continued Excellence as well award will, will definitely be aware of this. Um, but basically, um, Plymouth is the first compassionate city in England, so it's something to be really, really proud of. Um, it's about promoting the, the topic and, and not shying away from the taboo subject of death um, and how we all work across the city, um, making sure that people are more informed and compassionate towards those facing end of life or experiencing the loss or bereavement. The overwhelming support has been demonstrated for the Charter um, and the creation of end-of-life networks for Plymouth and surrounding communities that's made up of individuals and groups and organisations working together to deliver the Charter's aims. Local government strives to maintain and strengthen quality services um, for the most fragile and vulnerable uh, amongst us, um, whether that's a serious crisis, illness, death and loss. Um, it can impact on any of us during any time of our lives. A compassionate city is a community that absolutely recognises and addresses this social fact. St Luke's are really proud to be part of this vital conversation. Um, it will encourage joined up thinking. Our city will put ideas into action and see positive outcomes that do support everyone um, in times of difficulty and loss, regardless of their age or background. An important part of this um, which is outlined in the Charter, is the recognition and raising awareness around death and dying and loss and care and the impact that these have. Um, it's in communities and workplaces that we need to tackle these taboo subjects. And for this to happen, we need to work together with everyone who has an interest um, in a more open discussion. So there are 
different ways that this charter is delivered. Um, St Luke's works with the End of Life Compassionate Network. We have various um, initiatives running. The Compassionate Employers is what I'm here to talk to you about today, but there's Compassionate Schools. We deliver Compassionate Friends training, and I'll go on to that in more detail later. It's around the motivation to learn from each other and support each other. Um, I'll ensure when these slides are shared with everybody that the, the links are all available here for you, so it's just easy access. Um, this is where we'll cover now the importance of this recognition within the workplace and how it links in with the Wellbeing Awards and how you can get the Continued Excellence Award. So bereavement is a fundamental cause of poor well-being, and it's important that we are there as employers and people to help others work through it. As you can see, any one time, there's one in 10 employees that are likely to be affected by death. Over half would leave their employer if they didn't get the proper support. And those that were in employment, over a third of them had said that they weren't treated with compassion by their employer. You then have the additional um, impact of the death of a colleague in a workplace um, and have to consider the impact of that on when you're supporting your employees. So just to cover off some of the, the kind of effects of this um, and on performance. So poor performance may be challenged rather than actually offering, to, offering the support to the people in challenging times. We have a responsibility to play a supportive role um, ensuring that that support is there during that most difficult time in a person's life. Um, and as you can see there, it, take, it can take months before people regain their interest and performance in work. And it's really important to show that compassion and recognition. There are various impacts here um, that we've covered off. Um, you can see uh, over two weeks um, on average, I don't think there is a normal time for someone to experience bereavement. And this is where you have to make sure that you are showing compassion and adapting to your employees' needs. You've got the, the kind of imp impacts outside of work as well. Have they got more caring duties? They're going to be less confident about how they return to work. How are their colleagues going to speak to them? Will people do the, the avoiding tactic? Fear of being exposed, as in, will they get upset in meetings? They're feeling less confident. Um, the low self-esteem and doubt their ability. Um, so there's so much to consider when supporting wellbeing for staff if they are um, have experienced a, a bereavement. Um, this is basically what you can do um, and how you can support your employees when they're going through this. Um, you'll see those five, five tips there. Um, I won't read the slide to you, but as well as being the right thing to do um, in line with the duty of care, providing support for a grieving employee will support their well-being, which has an impact on their engagement levels and how they're able to do their roles, as all of the stats that Claire's just share, shared have shown. And therefore, um, it makes good business sense, as well as um, being a generally compassionate approach. So what can we do to support you um, becoming a compassionate employer? We have various training um, available to you. Um, there, you can see here we have compassionate friends and champions, which I'll go into a bit more detail in a moment. There's policies and procedures, again, which we can, as St Luke, support you with developing a support pack made available to employees. And also, as mentioned recently with the manager side of things, it's really important that your managers are confident in being able to have these difficult conversations and having that awareness of your customer source um, and making sure that your policy policies are good for, for business. So this is basically the session that I referred to. We have the Compassionate Friends training session. This is the first step in um, taking this forward for you. So a compassionate friend is someone who is able to listen, is to able to offer um, the words of encouragement that are needed and be able to guide and advise people. And these sessions are provided to, to your people um, and you they will develop um, and learn to be confident with having those conversations. So they become less taboo um, and generally making it a more um, open conversation. Um, I'll go again into detail in a moment about when you can get, how you can get those dates to attend those various sessions. Um, you then can go on to become a compassionate champion. 
So there will already be a compassionate friend. They will then attend further training to, to be taught how to train compassionate friends so that you can then set this own network up within your organization um, and have that running as one of your wellbeing initiatives. Um, they'll be given a toolkit as well to help run this compassionate friends awareness session. So there's an awful lot that we can do to support and develop um, your, your teams um, to set this up. Um, and as you can see here, we, we are now part of the Continued Excellence Award with the Wellbeing Awards. Um, so this is those employers that do implement the Charter Objective. Um, you'll have your successes celebrated and promoted via our social media platforms and websites. You'll demonstrate how you're meeting those criteria um, and how you can do that is to sign up to the End of Life Network um, via that link below. Um, and we will then take you forward and, and help you become part of the end of life network and a compassionate employer. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so that, sorry, I, I'm conscious I've, I've talked really quickly, but that's how you become a compassionate employer. And it shows how it fits into the bigger picture as well. Um, and uh, my colleague, sorry, I should have mentioned at the beginning, Abina is, is on the call as well. And she is happy um, to support with any questions that we might have, but we can follow up afterwards to really get that ball rolling for you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, yeah, some excellent stuff in there. Um, there was, I know we're, we're pushed for time, but there was just one question, which I think we'll, we'll kind of do quickly now. And it was from Emma, Emma King. Um, and she's asked, is this only available for bereavement or would it apply for staff working at a mental health hospital? Should I answer that one, Lee? <laughs> Thanks, thank Abs. you. That's all right. Um, yeah, so the session focuses mainly on um, bereavement and death and dying. The sort of model that we use, LEND, I guess, could be applied in different um, instances, but the session is around um, bereavement and loss, um, death and dying. Thanks, Abs. Is that okay? Hopefully it's okay, Emma. And as, as we said before, everything's going to be shared afterwards. And I'm sure, you know, if, if anyone wanted a more detailed conversation with any of our speakers this morning, they'd be more than happy for, for people to get in touch with them direct as well. Um, right, we're going to jump on to the next um, presenters. And we've got Gemma and Jess from um, Plymouth City Council joining us next to take everyone through some examples of some of the excellent work um, they've been doing over at Plymouth City Council um, as wellbeing champions. So um, welcome, Gemma, and welcome, Jess, I will um, again unmute myself and pass over to you guys. Thank you so much, Greg. Thanks everybody so far for all your amazing presentations. Hopefully you can see my screen and hopefully you can ignore my shiny forehead this morning, <laughs> which I noticed when I came on the call earlier. So my name is Gemma Freeman. I'm the wellbeing specialist at Plymouth City Council um, and I work in the health, safety and wellbeing team. Hopefully Jess has had um, issues with sound, but I'll hopefully be able to allow her to introduce herself. Jess, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um... Yeah, it's working at the moment. So um, my name's Jessica Dan. I'm one of our a collection of wellbeing champions within Plymouth City Council. Amazing. Thank you, Jess. So all I'm going to do this morning is just give you a little bit of a snapshot of how we prioritise wellbeing at Plymouth City Council, how we work with our wellbeing champions and some of the incentives that we've done throughout the period of the pandemic. So to give you an overview, this is what Plymouth City Council looks like. We have the six directorate areas um, and we also obviously provided a temporary COVID emergency organisational response centre. Put your teeth in to say that one, that's quite a long one. Um, so we provided a heap of support throughout Plymouth during um, the COVID response. What we do in Plymouth City Council to engage and recruit champs is different variations of things. So we do a recruitment drive where we advertise a space and explain what a wellbeing champion is. And then you express your interest to see if there is space in your department. And that is something that we found was quite important in terms of recruiting our wellbeing champions, is that we didn't want to have one cluster of champs in one area of our directorate. We wanted to make sure that we had a wide offering across the whole organisation. So we ensure that we've got, um, you know, a range of people in different directorates. Um, the champ would then obtain agreement with the line manager attend the training with LiveWell, and then once the training is complete, we add you to our internal intranet pages, 
and we also add you to our Teams channel, our quarterly meeting and our monthly drop-in sessions. Once that's all happened, you have ongoing support via myself and the Teams channel, um, and you can create an agenda item on your team meeting to show that you're prioritizing well-being and introduce yourself as a well-being champ. And then part of your role will be to share any campaigns or information across to your teams, and then you enjoy starting being a well-being champ in the organization. This is how we show our champs in our organization. So we have a live intranet page and I joined Plymouth City Council two years ago and I found it really difficult to come to grips with who was who and where everybody was because of the size of the organization. So I got the rights to edit the intranet page. So now any member of our staff can basically roll their cursor over a name and what will happen as this is live is the picture of that champ will appear and you are able to call them, instant message them, or email them directly from that page. What we try to also do is encourage the organization to recognize that you do not have to contact the champ that works in your directorate. If you prefer to do that, that is absolutely fine, but we try to encourage the idea that the wellbeing champs are for everybody across the board. Having the pictures there, means you know who that person is because the organization is so large, it enables you to identify that individual. So in 2019, we were authorized by our senior management team to enroll an additional 30 champs. So when I arrived in the organization, we had authorization for 30 and we increased, and we increased that to 60, um, which we are still recruiting for at the moment. We've reached 38. Um, and during the pandemic, people's priorities changed, um, but that's an ongoing recruitment now in Plymouth City Council. How our champs record their interventions with people is on a live system called FirmStep. So we, again, edited this as a working group. So each time they interact with anybody and support anybody in the organization with anything well-being related, they then record this. The purpose of us doing this is so that we can provide a measure for senior management. And this is what our log looks like. So myself or Jess as a champ would go into the firm step program and log that intervention and that time. When all of our champs across the organization have done that, I am then able to pull out that evidence to prove that there is a priority of well-being in the organization to present for our senior leadership team. And these are just some examples on the screen in front of you. It looks quite complicated. There's a lot of information on there, but obviously those that work with Excel spreadsheets will know that you can pull out that information, which makes it more viable to present to senior leadership teams in our organization. During the last year in the pandemic, we were luckily, we were awarded, and here it is, I bought it with me today, like a blue Peter. Here's one I made earlier. And we were awarded with our bronze award. Previously, um, we were awarded with the National Wellbeing Charter, which was a sponsorship by uh, Public Health England, but this no longer exists. So now we've been working alongside Live Well Southwest, and we achieved our bronze award last year. And to be awarded with our bronze award, we had to demonstrate our commitment to well-being through the steering group, the well-being champions, a workplace health needs assessment, health and safety assessments, and a well-being action plan. And currently now, we're halfway through uh, working through our silver awards, which we're hoping to have completed by the summer. So access to the help and changes as part of that bronze award is that we updated the staff room web page weekly rather than kind of quarterly or monthly to make it more current and reactive to any themes that were running through the organization. We increased the well-being champ um, and how to contact those champs and recognize those champs. Um, we gave additional training to our managers on how to access our employee assistance program. We made drop-in sessions available. We created a virtual parent support group. We also recognize that we're all living in such a digital world at the moment. We're on screens and we're spending a lot of time on technology. So we looked at providing a digital detox session. We offer mental health workshops. And also during the pandemic, obviously, we gave guidance and issued out over 300 pieces of equipment for all our employees that are working from home. We worked alongside St. Luke's for the Compassionate Friends training. And we also did some managing remotely commissioned to support the working from home on how to work, uh, work remotely. 
obviously, ah we all say the pandemic hit us. What do we do now? Um, and COVID-19 cases were rising in Plymouth. We had to kind of think very quickly on our feet how we adapt that wellbeing offer to all of our employees. As Plymouth City Council have a city response to that pandemic, we had to consider what we were going to do to support businesses and residents of Plymouth City Council. Um, but obviously, we also had to have an organisational response. So my focus today, just to show you, is what we did as an organisation. And those amazing pictures you can see there are some of my colleagues who volunteered their time during the pandemic um, to provide um, as guides and ushers throughout um, the pandemic. That's not their normal role. And they did say I could share these pictures today. So <laughs> there's some lovely pictures there. So pre-COVID, this is the kind of things, as I mentioned earlier, that we offered to our employees across the organisation. We had to look at that offer and think how we can adapt and make it more virtual and more appropriate during a pandemic. So once the pandemic was announced, we had a look at some plans. We recognised that not all of our employees had families at home, partners at home, a high percentage of our employees lived alone. So we created a four step plan on tackling loneliness during the pandemic. We offered virtual one to one coffees with the champs at any time. We did the digital detox workshop, as I mentioned earlier. We created a parental support group. So while the schools were closed, we had a lot of feedback that our staff were struggling to work and parent and teach all at the same time. So we created a weekly virtual parent support group to offer advice, share support, um, sometimes just to have a moan and a whinge about the children. Um, whatever that looked like, there was a virtual support group our parents could join in with. We did the bereavement support for anybody that had any loss and we had the compassionate friends training with St Luke's to provide that. We provided twice a week wellbeing drop-in sessions, a mental health addition to any team meetings across the organisation. We also took a wellbeing survey across the whole organisation to get a measure, a temperature measure of how our staff were doing so that we could make sure we were reactive in an appropriate manner. We also gave all of our employees a flexible approach to their working hours so that if they did have commitments at home, they could work within hours that suited them. We gave an additional two days flexi for all of our staff. And we also worked with the DWP and provided April Futures, which is a mental health coaching service, which is up to nine months. We created social channels on our Microsoft Teams so that you could connect with non-work related um, issues because we'd lost those social interactions. Jess and I would love to go for a coffee in the refectory, catch up on whatever series we're watching, and we aren't able to do that anymore. So we recognize that that social element of being at work was missing. We also offered all our staff an extra day's annual leave um, and an ability to carry forward any annual leave because we were aware that all of our staff were working above and beyond most of their remit at the moment. We have to recognise, and this is something I'm quite passionate about, that there's a percentage of our workforce that do not have access to PC. PCs. Um, they are labour workers out and about carrying the bins. So we had to make sure we were reaching everybody in the organisation. So what we did is we printed out booklets of help and QR codes were posted around those staff rooms to make sure we were capturing all of the staff across the organisation and not just those that were sat in front of a PC. We also offered out um, some COVID impact training, which some of our wellbeing champs and myself included did, which was around the psychological first aid COVID-19 response, which was online training. So some of our champs um, did some of the, that training and, and offered and utilized that training in the organization. So the social element, this is the fun bit, and we all love the social part of what we did. And um, so we made sure that we interacted on a social level and that everything wasn't always work focused. Of course, we were responsible in making sure that our jobs were done and deadlines were completed, but we wanted to make sure that we also socially interacted. So we here we have, we shared with our uh, Plymouth City Council Bake Off, one of our amazing cakes, um, and we shared that through our Microsoft Teams channel. These 
our proper restaurant standard that made me super hungry. So as you can see, we also shared some more of our Bake Off images there in our channels. We had our keeping in touch day pics. So we recognized that when our individuals were out and about, we wanted to make it almost real. So you would share a keeping in touch day picture with your team. And we recognize that in our organization, we have a huge amount of animal lovers. So there's Teddy, one of our dogs from um, our health and safety specialist. It's one of his dogs and he was sharing a touch, keeping in touch day pic with us. We recognize across the organization a love for animals. So we created a pets gallery. So we all knew who our new work buddies are. And that dog on the right there is my new work colleague, Brian, that I have at home. Um, and we found that that gave everybody a sense of what your home environment looked like. And it also brought a bit of humor to the organization. And there's some more pet gallery pictures there for you to all enjoy. We recognised that our staff were really focused on a COVID response. So we wanted to make sure not only for the residents of Plymouth that we were sharing information around what we were doing during the pandemic, but we also wanted to share those good news stories. So some of you may or may not have seen that um, during the difficult time, we shared the story about our Mr and Mrs Beaver, which have joined us at our pool farm reserve. It was really important to make sure those good, good news stories were shared across the organisation organization. The impact all of this that has had on staff, we requested some feedback from staff and we had a couple of statements from the parental support group and also from Jerry that works down at Pool Farm in terms of how that made them feel, um, how that impacted them. So we made sure what we were offering was giving a positive impact to our staff, um, especially the Beaver release video. All of our staff seemed to really enjoy when they saw that video as a positive news story. So I'm going to hand over to Jess now to explain a little bit about what she has done through that time. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Gemma. And hi, everyone. Um, so firstly, I'd just like to say I am super lucky the well-being champion because as you can see and hear, um, we are all supported by Gemma, who's our head of well-being. And Gemma has been amazing throughout the last 12 months in enabling all of us as well-being champions to remain connected and to continue doing what we're doing to support our teams and, like Gemma said, any others in the organisation. And um, I think what's really key to this is Gemma obviously works organisationally, but we know, and just in how we interact as humans, is that we like to actually, we like the familiar, we like to interact and be comfortable with who we're knowing. So as a well-being champion, actually the work we do within our teams is really important. And when I talk about this, I'm not just talking about me, I'm talking about all of our well-being champions who um, most of these ideas I've stolen. We have, like Gemma said, a Teams channel and we share, it works like a Facebook page. We share ideas, we have monthly drop-ins, partly just to vent um, and talk about how our teams are doing, but also partly to share ideas. Um, and we always celebrate key things. So we've got Mental um, Health Awareness Week coming up in a couple of weeks and we've already got um, different activities planned in from that and they're really informal most of it is just everything that we do is mostly really informal it doesn't have to be this big song and dance it's just it's just organized really casually so I think one day I'm hosting a yoga session via YouTube for staff to access so things like that it it those little those little contact points count. So over the last year, um, before that, I was doing running clubs, um, encouraging people to cycle to work. There was a swim club going on. We had walking groups. We had mental health drop-in sessions in our offices. Um, I went and visited other offices. My team is in a number of different offices. Obviously, COVID changed all of that. And whilst we're just starting now to um, 
get some of those run clubs back in. The other things we did, we created a channel. Um, we organized things with charities that were still open, especially in the summer. So team soup runs, like Gemma said, I really share, try to share the good news stories across our teams um, as well. And particularly during, during COVID as our teams are very operational. We deal a lot with rough sleepers and people at crisis. It was really important to show that actually we were still working and we were still doing all of this amazing stuff you don't know about when you're in a different team. The other thing, we have a book club, so people share great books that they read. And, um, oh, what else do I do? And, yeah, share things that we're liking to cook but also key achievements of us at home so we had lots of things about gardening projects diy projects all just enabling people to stay in touch um so as we move forward into 21 and 22 i'm really conscious that my role will change a bit but actually i think it's for the better and i've been able to connect people in my team that I didn't necessarily know about before. So there has been lots of positives um, about COVID and changing how we work and making sure people know it's important to connect and people are much more open now in talking to me about mental health um, and enabling me to direct them to PAM Assist or some of the other support groups that we run. Um, so that's a really high level overview and it's so brief because many of the other well-being champions do many other different things. But I think my point is mainly just every little bit counts. It makes a difference and people do appreciate it. Thank you, Jess. I'm really conscious we're probably running over time because we're both so passionate about what we do. So um, I'll, leave, I'll leave it up to you now, Greg. Thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you, Gemma. And thank you, Jess. And yeah, you've, you've kind of said it all there, really. It, that passion kind of like, you know, shines through. Um, and like you said, Jess, you know, you guys are examples of well-being champions across the city and across your organization and other ones. And they do make such a difference. And I think that some of the stuff you were talking about as well, Gemma, earlier in your presentation around the structure you've put behind your well-being work at PCC, I suppose for the businesses here today, maybe for the first time or for those that are looking to develop their well-being offer, it gives you guys an idea of what what's needed to make it sort of organization wide you need that structure you need that sort of plan that that steering group but then you also need those individuals across the organization doing those little things that make such a big difference so thank you to both of you you're um you're an inspiration to us all um Thanks, we Greg. are running that's okay guys we are running a little bit behind but i'm still very um uh, sort of like aware that we should be having a little break so i make it three minutes to 11 on my on my clock so if we can take three or four minutes just to go and grab a cup of tea stretch our legs get get up from our desks and tables etc and we'll come back just after 11 o'clock and then we'll be doing some awards and, and celebrating the work that's been going on over the last 12 months so yeah i'll disappear and i'll be back in three minutes and we'll get going again thanks guys
Okay, everyone. Welcome back. Hopefully you've all managed to get away from your desks for a few minutes. Important. We keep moving. We're not designed to be sat, um, sat down all day. So any opportunity you get, you should get away from your desk, stretch the legs and go and grab a drink of water or a cup of tea or whatever, whatever your favorite tipple is. Um, so yeah, thanks again to all of our presenters this morning. Um, so much, um, you know, kind of passionate and, and informative work there. Um, but what we're going to be looking at next is celebrating some of the work that, that's gone on over the last 12 months, uh, both within our Wellbeing Champion sort of network and also with our awards. So I'll pass you across to Nita, um, who's going to take us through some Wellbeing Champion work. Hi everyone, can you all hear me okay? Is that okay, Greg? Yeah, lead, yeah hear brilliant, you loud wonderful. And Thanks, Nita. Thank you. Okay, so welcome everybody. My name's Nita Dodd, and I'm going to be talking to you about the Wellbeing Champion Programme, which is hosted by the Wellbeing, Work, Wellbeing at Work team for Live Well Southwest. Uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces today. And I'm really sort of looking forward to, to talking to you about the, the Wellbeing Champion Programme, which many of you are, are already familiar with. Um, so after an uncertain year, uh, we currently have around 345 wellbeing champions across Plymouth. Um, so that's 65 within LiveWell and external businesses around 280. And we heard some really fantastic sort of um, information from Gemma earlier of, of Plymouth City Council uh, around the fantastic work they're doing um, within their, their organisation and certainly sort of gold standard as far as we're concerned really uh, at Live Well. So well done Gemma and the team. Okay, so our plan for this year, I mean we've had obviously plenty of time to, over, over the last year or so to be thinking about what we could be doing um, you know with, with the future of the, of the Wellbeing at Work programme. So our plan really is around engaging with Wellbeing Champions. So obviously over that time you know we sort of you know, uh, people have had other priorities sort of happening around Covid and we've sort of acknowledged that and, and now we just feel it's a really good time with the conference today to start really engaging again with with our well-being champions um, and obviously celebrating the good work over the past year as well because you know despite sort of the, the you know the covid situation uh, people have really you know some some well-being champions have really sort of carried on sort of throughout and have really done some fantastic work um, you know towards the well-being of their teams during this really difficult time so so a, a time to celebrate today and really pleased to be sort of doing that uh, we're looking at sort of reintroducing our bi-monthly wellbeing champion meetings. Uh, so those will be kind of like a network sort of meeting. Um, so really getting that sort of back on the on the sort of uh, the, the table again, really, um, so that we can get. It's a huge network, you know, sort of through 345 wellbeing champions across Plymouth. Um, so really good to sort of keep those people sort of uh, linked up, really. Uh, and talking of linking everybody up, the launch of our uh, Plymouth Wellbeing Champions Facebook page, which sort of came online sort of just in the last week, which we're really pleased about. It's something we've been really trying to sort of get sort of up and running for a little while now. So it's finally happened. So really pleased to sort of have that, um, you know, because it will really sort of help to keep the, the Wellbeing Champions uh, linked together. And also expanding our new Community Wellbeing Champion programme, which we did sort of start, we started sort of trialling that at the end of last year um, and really sort of looking at kind of, um, you know, moving forward with that. So, wonderful. Okay, right, so let's find out a little bit more about Wellbeing Champions then, for those of you who aren't familiar with what they do. They receive free training, which can be delivered in your work workplace or community setting. And that's really around sort of what it is to be a Wellbeing Champion um, and what, you know, well, how that role can sort of be delivered in an organisation. Because obviously it's, it differs in, in depending on the organisation you're in. Uh, they make a positive impact on the health and wellbeing of employees uh, within a business or community setting. That's kind of why they're there. And they also receive direct support from Live Well Southwest Wellbeing at Work team to focus on the wellbeing of their colleagues. So a, a direct link into um, our team at Wellbeing at Work for Live Well. Um, one of my colleagues, Charlie Roberts, is um, the lady who kind of links in very closely with the Wellbeing Champions. Um, and I'm sure she won't mind me saying that she does an absolutely fantastic job uh, as well as being the person who who launched our uh, Facebook page as well our Wellbeing Champions in Plymouth Facebook page so well done Charlie 
Okay, moving on. So just to talk a little bit about a, a, a challenge that was set a little while ago, the September challenge, which many of you did actually take part in. It happened between the 7th of September and the 4th of October last year. And many organizations took part in the, in the, uh, the walking challenge, the workplace walking challenge, which was delivered by Active Devon and Livewell Southwest in partnership with Plymotion and Plymouth City Council. So the, the winner was actually Home Start Southwest. Um, I mean, it was really difficult to sort of choose between some of the entries that we had, but certainly Home Start Southwest, uh, which was led by wellbeing champion Susie Holdsworth and Claire Birchall, who encouraged physical and wellbeing activity in the workplace. Susie from Home Start said it's not always about the huge gestures and lots of health campaigns and I think that's really I think that really says it all you know it's not about the big this sort of you know fantastic things that are kind of happening it's not always about those big gestures it's about some those simple things the basics you know walking um certainly not something that um you know is too sort of complex for people to do and certainly so Susie and um and Claire was sort of doing a lot of work around sort of walk and talk meetings. They sort of got their team to be clanging in the workplace. Uh, they sort of distributed uh, leaflets and um, encouraged displays in the uh, office environments and also lunchtime walks as well, which kind of really went down sort of well with, with the team. Right, so over to our nominees for this year's Wellbeing Champion of the Year Award, which uh, many of you will, will be familiar with. Uh, so first up, we have Ali Crane, who uh, is, was a nominee. She's actually one of my uh, work colleagues. She works within the Wellbeing team, does some fast, fantastic work this year around sort of keeping us all connected. Uh, so that's Ali. Um, and Sarah Rogers, who um, works with the, is an occupational therapist for the Live Well West therapy team. And then we have Natalie Atkins, who is the from Chadlewood Preschool. And then we have Georgia Miller, who is patient choice facilitator for the Devon Referral Support Services, uh, which is part of the C uh, NHS Devon CCG. And we also have Julie Jenks, or Julia Jenks rather, uh, for Live Well Tavistock Community Rehab Team. Next up, we have Katie Graham, who works um, with Plymouth City Council and Gemma. There we go. Gemma's holding up uh, the nominee certificate there proudly. Thank you, Gemma. That's wonderful. So a fine example there of uh, the, the, the certificates that or frame certificates that people get when they are uh, nominees for the, the Wellbeing Champion of the Year Award. Uh, and then, of course, we have Gemma herself there looking very sort of proudly holding her certificate up as well. So uh, Gemma is the wellbeing specialist for Plymouth City Council. And we heard her talking earlier as well, all about the fantastic work they're doing at Plymouth City Council. Next up, we have Charlotte Gill, uh, who is a physiotherapist for the CCRT team uh, at Livewell and also a second year nominee. So, so Charlotte, Charlotte was actually nominated for an award last year as well at our um, annual conference at Borringdon Golf Club, if any of you sort of came along. I know many of you did. OK, we also have Catherine Hendrick of Co-op Logistics Depot in Plymouth, and she's holding up her certificate there as well. Uh, and we also have Jane Waite, who works for Live Well, Plymouth Options, and was also a runner up last year at our awards. Okay, next up again, we have Nat Brown, who works for TH March, and Lucy Thomas, who also works for Live Well, Plymouth Options, and also nominated as a runner up last year, along with Jane Waite. Okay, so our first runner up is Charlotte Gill. Um, so Charlotte, uh, as I already said, is, is a physiotherapist and she was nominated for Wellbeing Champ of the Year Award uh, for the second year running. She also, uh, also won the Devon Sports Award Workplace Activity Champion Award back in 2019. Um, so Charlotte was nominated by Cherry Roddy, who's the CCRT lead 
who said that Charlotte has held this frontline team together during a global pandemic with her passion and determination for the well-being of the team through initiatives and utilising resources such as table tennis and team competitions. And basically, she's, she's never failed to put a smile on everyone's face. So well done, Charlotte. You are our first runner up today. Our second runner up is Sarah Rogers. So Sarah was nominated by Joe Ansel from the West, West Community Therapy team, who said Sarah deserves the Wellbeing Champion of the Year Award 2020 because of her positive and motivating attitude. She has an uplifting outlook on life and brings this sunshine into our workplace. Also, she, she said that Sarah is definitely the glue that has held our fractured team together throughout our redeployment to different teams for the past nine months. And, it, and obviously that was all in response to the global pandemic. Right, okay, so thinking about who perhaps our winner might be. And here she is, winner of the Wellbeing Champion of the Year Award 2020 is Georgia Miller. Great. <laughs> So well done, Georgia. And Georgia was nominated by Louise Harcharovagiri uh, from the Devon Referral Support Services, who said that despite personal issues, Georgia has remained committed to her Devon Referral Support Services role and her role as a wellbeing champion. She's presented a positive attitude and really helped the members of our wider DRSS team who have had to shield or have been isolated at home during the pandemic. So Georgia goes that extra mile to make a difference and strives to make every contact count. She is a perfect example of a young, dynamic wellbeing champion. So congratulations to our winners. Uh, so to Sarah, to Charlotte and to Georgia, obviously our overall winner. Um, your trophies will be on their way to you very soon. OK, right. So. So just a, a quick sort of roundup, really, with some images uh, of our wellbeing champions over the past year or so. So a few familiar faces there, I'm sure, um, within those. And again, I mean, this is a, a few photos of many um, and all of, you know, congratulations really to all of our wellbeing champions who are all doing a fantastic job. Not just the winners, but, but everybody else, the other sort of uh, 345 <laughs> wellbeing champions across Plymouth. Okay, right, so back to you, Greg. Thank you so much, Nita, and well done to all those wellbeing champions, both the kind of nominees and, and obviously the winners as well. Um, phenomenal work going on across, across Plymouth. Um, and well done to you as well, Nita and Charlie, and I suppose, and Jenny as well, who's up next organizing kind of like an awards kind of a ceremony virtually where you have to obviously get things out to people in advance then they have to take a picture then you have to send it back so thank you to all involved in 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 obviously allowing us and enabling us to celebrate this work today um so up next is jenny that's going to be doing something similar but obviously focused on the well-being at work awards Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you can see the screen and hear me all right. Can you I always feel like a magician when you say that? Can, can you see the screen? So let's go through um, some other positive news that we that we can celebrate. So for those that don't know anything about the Wellbeing at Work Award scheme, I just wanted to give a very brief overview. It consists of four levels to achieve bronze, silver, gold, and then some further challenges um, for continued excellence. Within Bronze, we ask you to um, really embed well-being into your workplace by setting up a workplace steering group. And this group needs to involve um, everybody from senior management across departments from the ground up so that you have good representation in your business. It needs to involve people that are interested and motivated in well-being. And it needs to be formalized and preferably be a standalone um, group so that it makes well-being really important and a priority within your business. We ask you to take um, an annual health needs assessment or a staff well-being survey. We have examples of all of these that we can send and share with, uh, send to you and share with you. But within that, we ask you to look at well-being. So we ask you to ask your employees about their sleep, their stress, um, how they eat, their exercise, you know, really finding out um, what is a priority for you to, to look at within your business. 
we ask you to look at health and safety and we um, look at integrating well-being champions um, into your organization. Ideally, we would like sort of around 10% of the workforce to be well-being champions. And this ensures that you have good representation um, and that you can really get the message of well-being out to your organization. And finally, it's about developing an action plan. So what would you like to address first um, within well-being? Silver and gold consists of um, seven um, assessments on well-being areas. These are based on the Public Health England and the Business in the Community toolkits. For silver, we ask you to complete three of your choice and gold um, would be a further four. At the next level, continued excellence. Um, as we've heard this morning, we ask you to take part in the Compassionate Employer Programme with St. Luke's. And then we have the Disability Confidence Scheme with CTEC Plus. And we're looking to introduce further wellbeing projects this year into um, this area. We also offer the Micro Business Award Programme. So if you have less than 25 employees in your um, organisation, then we have a slightly smaller programme for you to um, take part in. And just to let you know that we do hold regular quarterly forums, which cover lots of the wellbeing topics and will also give you an opportunity to network. So moving on to our winners this year. So congratulations, first of all, to the Co-op Plymouth um, Depot who achieved bronze the, um, in February last year. So some of the things that the co-op have done, um, they found the health needs assessment really useful. It really gave them a true picture of how their colleagues are feeling and that identified the changes that they wanted to see. They've installed new bike racks to encourage cycling to work. They improved their canteen menu and introduced a lot more health and well-being literature. They found that the well-being steering group was um, a great idea and was very inclusive. And because new people um, came to the group, they had lots of new fresh ideas. Darts championships and creating reading um, corners. And they have 10 well-being ch champions. And I think a good statement there, never be afraid to ask for help as you are not alone. A problem shared is a problem that can be solved. And here's a few of the things that they have um, been doing. In the bottom left-hand corner, I believe, I think this is possibly the only nightclub <laughs> that has been going on during COVID that has been allowed. This is specifically for staff that work through the nights. They need somewhere to go and hang out and chill out. And um, I don't think it serves alcohol or, or uh, has any dance music or anything, but um, it's a comfy place. Um, they've introduced things like scratch cards um, that was to raise money on a World Mental Health Day um, and the money went to mind. They have um, acts of kindness. You can see there's a sort of um, a, a rip off um, poster there where you can rip off a kindness statement and give that to somebody. Um, and they look at all sorts of other things like cholesterol, asthma. Um, they've got lots of topics here that, that they've been engaged in. And Kath Hendrick, who's featured in the blue top, she is a wellbeing champion and she's actually somebody who delivers Connect5 training um, to her organisation. So she has done the course and become a trainer. And if anybody in your organisation is interested in sort of... Um, delivering training themselves within their organization, please talk to us because it, it might be something that you, we could offer you. So next up, we have ACE Skills, part of Transforming Futures, who have also um, achieved bronze. So congratulations to them. Um, ACE Skills, as their name sort of reveals, is, is a schools <laughs> network. Um, they have 16 wellbeing champions across different sites and across different staffing levels. Again, this is so important to make sure that you have good representation. And they are given time for training and support. And, they're, um, and that's by the mental health lead within A schools. They have a regular well-being day where they can focus on a topic, and that is such a good idea. Well-being is such a huge um, assortment of different things that if you can just focus on one topic, that can really help. 
teaching, as we know, has is can be stressful, and um, t schools have had a lot of um, different things to do over the last uh, twelve months and different ways of working, and so they still place mental health at the highest level. They, when they can manage and are allowed, they do lots of coastal team walks accompanied by some cream teas, and they use Health Shield to support their staff medically. They take part in a variety of wellbeing training courses. And I think at the, at the end there, here at ACE, we take the well-being of our staff seriously and believe that happy, healthy staff make the best employees. And that's by Nikki Jewell, Head of Secondary Provisions. And um, these walks look very nice. I encourage you to look them up. Um, and uh, here's them accepting their uh, bronze certificate. So well done to ACE skills. Plymouth City Council, congratulations to them um, for achieving their bronze award in June. And we've already heard of the wealth of activities that are going on at Plymouth City Council. And there's Gemma waving the certificate with pride again. And um, so well done. And um, of course, they're aiming to get their 60 wellbeing champions um, very shortly across their departments and sites. And as we've heard, they have a huge um, remit of activity and training that is undergoing there. They have quarterly wellbeing champion group meetings. They regularly record their activity on a database. And a quote from Kim Brown, the service director for Plymouth City Council, we have recently adapted from face-to-face -face interactions, reviewed our offers and made more use of technology for our employees as we embrace digital well-being. We are committed as an employer to ensuring that the well-being of our employees is a priority and this journey will continue. And um, here are some other lovely pictures um, and obviously collecting our certificate as well. So moving on to the Plymouth Child Maintenance Group, who are part of the Department for Work and Pensions. Um, congratulations on them achieving uh, their silver award in June last year. So as part of that, they needed to choose um, three topics. Mental health is very important to the Department of Work and Pensions and nationally they committed to provide um, one to 50 ratio of mental health first stages across all of their Department of Work and Pensions sites. So um, within the Plymouth site, they have 24 qualified mental health first staters with 16 of them in um, the child maintenance group. They um, regularly hold um, a lot of men World Mental Health Day and Time to Talk, um, lots of mental health events. They hold regular meetings and um, have attended the two day workshops, stress management plans, one to ones, walking groups. They actually have well-being rooms on site. Um, so if you're lucky enough to have space to dedicate a room to that, then that would be fantastic. And they have a well, well, well newsletter, which um, provides regular um, comms to staff. They also tackled um, reducing the risk of suicide. Um, we offer assist training. So if you're ever interested in, in, in looking at that, we can help you with that. They have produced lots of information in their newsletters. They promote the um, employee assistance program, EAP. <laughs> Um, they have a charity for civil servants and they um, hold things like Brew Monday, which we've already sort of um, mentioned before, but it's important just to catch up with a colleague and just have a cup of tea or a coffee, um, be it virtually or face to face and just have a chat. So in terms of physical activity, healthy eating and healthier weight, um, for those that don't know, Plymotion can help you um, achieve a sustainable travel plan and Plymotion have helped the child maintenance group to do that. They provide showers, cycling, parking, adult cycle training, clubber size classes. I'm not quite sure what that is, but it sounds fun. Tai Chi, yoga, gymnastics. You must have to have lots of space for that. And uh, pure stretch. Um, quite a lot of different things. Blood pressure clinics, eat well workshops, sugar smart ambassadors. Um, I had to sort of try and summarize everything that they're doing, but it's very difficult to fit it all on a slide. 
Um, so here they are accepting their silver award. Um, so that's Natalie who heads up the awards for um, the child maintenance group and Claire Reader as well. And here's an example of just uh, one of the newsletters that they've put out to staff covering all sorts of things like avoiding addiction, um, COVID Christmas, let's hope we don't have one this year and many other things. And finally, they have also very successfully achieved gold. So congratulations to them achieving gold in February this year. And so just to quickly summarize that um, they uh, tackled domestic abuse. So something that's uh, very important is to promote disclosure, confidentiality and support and to offer staff flexi time if you can manage to do that. Flexi time can really benefit staff to help manage all sorts of things, be it exercise, um, time off to deal with uh, stress. If you can try and fit work more around you, it can really help. With drugs, alcohol and tobacco, they've um, undertaken quite a bit of training. They offer something called PAM Life Coaches. Again, they've got an employee assistance program. Um, they've involved training from Harbour and health checks. And anybody who wants help um, can ask for it and will be fully supported by line managers. Their muscular skeletal health, they offer a holistic well-being day, including therapeutic massage, gymnastics and yoga sessions. It sounds very, very fun. Walking meetings. Walking shouldn't ever be underestimated. We all need to get up and do more walking and stand away from the desk. And in terms of sleep and recovery, uh, they have rest and relaxation areas in every wing of the building. Um, they offer mindfulness and again, making sure that you promote and encourage breaks. And here's Natalie receiving her gold award certificate and they're moving on to continued excellence um, as we speak. So finally, if you haven't been involved in the awards programme and you feel inspired, please do get in touch with us. And just again, we would just want to wish um, um, all the businesses our congratulations from Wellbeing at Work for your fantastic achievement. And we do know how much work goes into it, but we hopefully, you hopefully find that it is very worthwhile and helps you to really focus on embedding wellbeing into your organisation. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. And yeah, well done to um, to all those businesses that have achieved those awards over the last 12 months. I think, like Jenny said, an awful lot of work um, goes into uh, achieving those awards. It's 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 quite an undertaking, but it's what's needed, obviously, to, to kind of make that well-being a priority across those businesses, across those organisations. So well done to everyone there. And thank you, Jenny, for taking us through that. Now, we are approaching um, 1130, so we may go a little bit over, and my apologies for that. Um, what we've got next is an opportunity to uh, just check back on any questions. And I've been keeping an eye on the chat bar as we've been talking this morning, and there were just a few questions that came through. So um, I'm going to go through those now. The first one was for Claire, um, Claire Turbo. At PHE, and it was from another Claire, Claire Baker at Barclays. Um, and first of all, she thanked you, Claire, um, for that presentation, and we'll certainly be checking out the One New Employer Toolkits. Um, but she asked, do you have any research or statistics on the relationship between mental health, um, well-being, and financial health? Um, because obviously within Barclays, that's something they've got that passion for. Um, <clears throat> hi, sorry, I haven't spoken for a few minutes now. Bless you. Um, yes, absolutely. And that is um, a big issue. And when you raised it in the chat bar, I, um, I did respond to you directly. Um, oh, but uh, yes, there is results on that. And I did notice that there's somebody from the, the pensions um, body, which I can't quite remember the name of. I think his name yeah, was Paul. I that's right yeah they've produced a, they've that that organization has produced some great resources around debt finances mental health and i know there are resources out there so i will um send some links to that um to greg thank you claire that's fab um the only other question that i um managed to pick up was one from douglas um at the kidney research uk just looking obviously to how he can get involved in the wellbeing champion program and obviously hopefully douglas you've got a bit of information from nita earlier and the last few slides um, that i'm going to cover uh, th this morning as well kind of cover that so we'll, we'll go to answer that now um, but yeah just the last few things from me what i will quickly do is share my screen again and hopefully this time uh, my slides behave themselves um okay bear me two seconds let's hope that works Uh, 
Okay, so yeah, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, just a few bits about things that are coming up um, before I move on to you know how to get in touch with us if you're interested in any of the things that we've covered this morning. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, this is one of a few events that we run um, for businesses over the year. Um, they are still going to be delivered virtually um, for 2021. So we've got two Wellbeing at Work forums coming up, one on Wednesday, the 14th of July, and one on Wednesday, the 6th of October. Both of these will be delivered on Zoom again, both in partnership um, with Devon and Plymouth Chamber of Commerce. And this is a perfect opportunity for me to thank the Chamber for the support that they're, 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 kind of, they're offering with these running of these events. Olivia in particular, who I know is on the call now, has been absolutely amazing in supporting us and organising today's event. Um, and that partnership will hopefully continue to build and allow us to reach kind of new new businesses um, that are looking to sort of improve their well-being at work offer and maybe access things like um, the well-being champion program um, but when you get the presentation out to you you can click on those links it will take you direct to the booking link for those forums and again it would be great to see you at those future events a few other thing things in the kind of uh, in, the, in the pipeline obviously we've not been able to deliver face-to-face um, -face training over the past 12 to, to kind of 14 months since the pandemic began um, but we are hoping to start returning to face-to-face -to -face training delivery in July as per the kind of the roadmap out of uh, the pandemic um, and in addition to that we should also be able to start looking at and returning to some of our other kind of face-to-face -face health um, services for example health checks um, as I think someone mentioned earlier we used to do things like health eating workshops so as we move through the summer into the autumn we hope to be getting those things back online and um, certainly in the past they were things that were quite popular within organizations and businesses um, and again if you're moving through the awards they're things that can complement and support the evidence that you have to build up in order to achieve those awards um, Something else that's coming up um, in the next few weeks, and I think it was Jess that mentioned this when she was talking about her wellbeing champion work, is we've got Mental Health Awareness Week, the 10th to the 16th of May. Um, and this year's theme is around nature and connecting with the environment around us. And I think it's just the perfect opportunity for us all to kind of get out and about. The sun's been shining recently, which should help that and connect with nature a little bit. Um, and what we're doing within that newly launched Facebook group for our wellbeing champions is we're going to be running a bit of a challenge for our wellbeing champions. And what we want to see um, during that week is as many pictures and photos of you connecting with nature, connecting with the environment, um, you know, with your colleagues um, uh, and yourself. And then off the back of that challenge, then there'll be a few kind of wellbeing related um, prizes that we'll award. Um, but it's just the perfect opportunity to to get out and to, to kind of raise that awareness of mental health and how connecting with nature can have a positive impact on that so you know, please do get engaged in, engaged in that challenge and in that week in any way you can um, and yeah final thing is about staying in touch so there's a number of ways you can contact the team some of which we've gone over already um, if you're yet to have registered with us then that would be the thing that i would recommend the most you can go to our um, website and the link again is attached to the um, presentation there and if you register with us what that basically does is it prompts a member of our team to get in touch and then whether it be well-being champions well-being at work awards whatever you're after we can then um, discuss that with you um, and, and, and kind of put those things into place. Um, so please do, if you haven't already done so, register with us online and we will get in contact with you. Um, that's everything from me. So I will quickly stop sharing. Um, while I've been talking, I'm not sure whether there's any questions that have come in in the chat bar. Um, but like I said at the very start, what you'll all be getting is an email off the back of today's event, which will include a number of things. It will include a link to or the presentations that you've seen this morning embedded within it. Um, there will also be an evaluation form and I'd really urge you all if you can fill those evaluation forms out. It's the way that we understand obviously how today's gone and whether you think there is uh, opportunities to improve things or help things run more smoothly. Um, so any kind of constructive feedback is greatly gratefully received. Um, you know, through those evaluation forms. Um, 
Another thanks, really, I suppose, thanks to, again, the Chamber and Olivia for supporting this morning's event. A massive thanks to my team, Charlie, Nita and Jenny, um, for uh, you know, planning and for supporting um, and, and, and sort of setting up this event. Um, obviously, it's slightly different to the face-to-face -face, face -face one we delivered 14 months ago, but it doesn't come without its sort of um, challenges. Um, and then lastly, a massive thank you to you all for attending this morning, for giving us your time. Um, for showing that passion and that willingness to make a difference around well-being at work. I think if if one thing is sort of um you know that's come out of the last 14 months is is the impact that our health and our workforce's health has on our ability to be able to do business. So whatever organization we're working in, whether we found our staff being furloughed, whether we found our staff working from home, or whether we found our staff at the coal face, you know, I suppose putting themselves at risk from COVID, um, you can't separate health and wealth is the thing that I've, I've heard people talking about so carry on doing the amazing jobs you're doing wherever they may be um, and please get in touch with us if there's anything we can do to support you all right so i'll leave you all in peace enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you soon